is populating. Recording and has begun. Thank you. With that, we will call to order the special meeting of the State Bar Board of Trustees of Monday, October 24th. Thank you all for your attendance and your interest. If I could uh, ask for a roll call, please. Broughton. Present. Chen. I see Take trustee. Oh, thank you. Cisneros, not present. Dela Cruz, not present. Duran. Here. No. Here. Seleg. Here. Shelby, not present. Soel. Present. Stallings, not present. Tony. Present. You have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you, trustees. Um, and we have the the slimmest of margins of a of a quorum. So we certainly hope to maintain that. I appreciate your presence today. Uh, this is a special meeting of the State Bar, as I've mentioned. There are two items on this uh, special meeting agenda, items 701 and 702 related to the case processing standards and our, our annual discipline report. So members of the public who are in attendance um, are encouraged and welcome to offer any public comment on either of those two items. And if you would care to do so, please indicate your interest by using the raise hand function in Zoom. Um, or if you are only on the phone, you may raise your hand by pressing star nine. We'll give uh, folks just a couple of seconds to do that if they care to. There does not appear to be any member of the public uh, wishing to address the board on either of those items. So I will ask uh, Ms. Wilson to please introduce item 701. Sure, um, and I have not seen, where are our presenters, Lisa? Uh, I am promoting them right now. Ewan is coming on and so is Lisa. Okay, great. So for item 701, we should have George. Yes. Him as well. Okay. So this um, item is the culmination of several um, months. I, it's nearly a year of work, uh, really with the heavy lifting being done by um, MAD, the Mission Advancement and Accountability Division, and uh, George uh, Cardona. So I think this is a wonderful achievement, um, marking his first year in the role as Chief Child Counsel. Uh, this a presentation will go over the final set of uh, proposed case processing standards and a separate distinct backlog metric proposal uh, for, for you uh, to approve. Subsequent to your approval, we will submit this proposal to the Legislative Analyst Office and others in Sacramento as outlined in Senate Bill 211. So I'm going to turn it over to George and Yuin to walk you through uh, the proposal really highlighting the changes or the updates since this was last presented to you. Not sure who's going first. So Yuin is going first and I think she's sharing her screen. We can we can see our we could see the shared screen it just went away. You mean, do you Sorry. want me to share my screen? No, I'm fine. I was uh, I was trying to unmute myself. Okay. We can now hear you now. Everybody can see it. Yeah, but you. I think you need to go to full screen mode. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. I hope this is the final update on SB 211 proposal work. Um, the same slide we have shared before. The reason we want to share this again. Uh, just to show you our work is tightly related with uh, SB 211 requirements of the four factors that need to be considered and the four areas that the standards must reflect. And uh, just refresh your memory, in May, we uh, provided updates on our review of LAO and auditor reports, six states comparison public survey results. July, uh, we reviewed ABA state comparison data, shared expert opinions, and the focus group results. September, uh, we talked about the final standards and the backlog metrics. 
uh, shared the uh, public comments, and we had some questions for you, including those three options. Today, we, are, uh, we will share our discussions with legislating staff, LAO, and the state uh, auditor group. Um, we will also um, provide, present the final uh, proposed standards and backlog metrics. Uh, last, the, we will talk about the preliminary staff needs analysis and our plan to conduct a comprehensive staff needs analysis once the standards are approved. Okay, George. So as you recall from the last meeting, um, we presented you with some options, particularly for the standards and for the backlog metrics. And the suggestion was that we have some discussions about that with legislative staff, the legislative analyst office and the state auditor. So we've had those discussions um, and uh, why don't we go to the next slide. Um, so if you remember, um, this is what the statute provides, pro develop proposed case processing standards, reflect the goal of resolving attorney discipline cases while having small backlogs. Um, and our proposal at the time included both processing standards and a backlog metric. Um, next slide. We explained that we were, by proposing both, trying to give two measures, both an average, which would be the uh, movement of the peak, the average time down, and a lowering of the spread so that the cases were more closely attuned around that with the backlog measure um, being the thing that would measure the spread. And if we can go to the next slide, we laid out these three options. Um, option one, the average case processing time standard being the only goal with 50% or less of cases closing beyond that goal. Option two, a idealized 90th percentile, that narrowed curve um, at 150% of the average time with that being the only goal and no more than 10% of cases closing beyond that goal. And option three, a combination where the average case processing time would be the standard, the peak of the narrowed curve and the idealized 90th percentile, 150% of that average time would be the backlog metric with a goal of having no more than 10% of cases beyond the metric goal, beyond the backlog metric. And that's laid out here. Options uh, one is basically the average case processing time. Option three being we would have the additional backlog metric. So after discussing it with you at the last meeting, we went and discussed it with legislative staff. If we can go to the next slide. Um, legislative staff, we met with them on September 29th, 2022, remotely. Um, they indicated their slight preference for option three um, in that for two reasons. Essentially, one, it provides more information, and two, the average standard is a shorter time frame than the backlog metric, so we would have a shorter goal, and we would have more information by having both. Um, they made some other comments. They wanted us to clarify that all times are cumulative, counted from the time of the receipt of the complaint, and we've done that in the report. Um, and to emphasize that these aren't going to change year to year, that these are fixed numbers for both the goal and the backlog metric. And we've tried to make that clear as well. They primarily deferred to both the legislative analyst office and the state auditor. Um, and we then followed up and met with them as well. So if we can go to the next slide. We met with the legislative analyst office on September 30th. They too indicated that they preferred option three as it provided more information than the other two options. They asked us to do some clarification in the report of the distinction between complexity and risk, noting that there was potentially some overlap between those, and we've tried to do that. Again, clarify that all times are cumulative, which we've tried to do. Their primary focus was, after expressing those interests, their primary focus was on the feasibility of the standards, um, and their expressed the view that the legislation legislature wanted not just standards, but also standards that were practically realistic, which um, would factor in both process changes and staffing changes, uh, made clear that there needed to be at least some preliminary staffing analysis so that the legislature could make an assessment as to whether the standards and the proposed staffing led to realistic staffing levels for attaining what were realistic goals. They also made clear that in their view, we had to factor in quality, that quality could not be sacrificed for speed and that the standards had to be realistic in that sense as well. Um, so that's our meeting with the legislative analyst's office. We also met with the state auditor's office. If we can go to the next slide. Um, they basically just looked at this and said, yes, they believed that option three was the one that would best satisfy their recommendation from their earlier audit report from April of 2021, 
which was, and we've got it quoted there, develop and recommend an appropriate backlog measure and goal, including the number of days at which a case should be added to the backlog, as well as a goal for the number of cases in the backlog. Um, so they indicated that our option three, they thought was the best to satisfy that. They too wanted us to clarify that the standards and backlog metrics aren't something that will change from year to year, but are in fact fixed. In other words, we're not looking at this as a curve that will vary from year to year, but we're basically setting this right now and setting fixed standards. Um, so based on all of that, um, we have gone ahead. The report now contains the final, essentially what is option three, sets a proposed standard, um, which is the average case processing time in each of these six categories, which we've gone over before. That's in the, cat, that's in the um, column. So for example, it would be 30 days as the average time to move a, to close a case in intake or which would be the 30 day standard there. And then we would also have a separate backlog metric, which is set at 150% of that. The goal being that no more than 10% of cases exceed that backlog metric. So for intake, the backlog metric would be 45 days. Any case that was not closed in intake within 45 days or moved on to investigation, in which case it would kick into the standard for one of the investigation prongs. Um, any case that was closed outside of 45 days in intake would be in backlog. Um, and we would report each year on the number of cases that closed an intake outside the 45 day time period. And that would be the number of cases in backlog for intake for that period similarly for each of the other categories. And so this is what's now reflected in the final report um, after the discussions with legislative staff, LAO, and the state auditor. I'm happy to address any questions. Um, the next thing is the staffing needs analysis, which Ewen will cover, um, which is the other part that the legislative analyst office made clear needed to be included in this report. Before Ms. Shank starts, let me just double check with the trustees to see if anybody has questions on what Mr. Cardona just presented. Thank you for putting that, slide, that last slide back up. Mr. Tony. Thank, thank you, Chair uh, Duran. Um, this is a great, uh, th this is a really well done report. And I think that this um, PowerPoint very much um, reflects what was in the report. Is this an appropriate time to ask questions on what's in the report or would it be more appropriate to wait until, I'm asking for your guidance chair, to wait until the presentation is done? I mean, certainly I feel like if there's a question specific to what Mr. Cardona just presented on the standard and the metrics, um, he, I think now would be a good time for that. And then when Ms. Shang talks about the staffing analysis, uh, we can open up for questions there as well. But if you prefer to wait, I'm okay. sure we'll get our questions answered. I, I have ahead. one question about what he presented. I'll wait for my other questions because they're based on the report itself, of which this is, of course, a summary. If okay. we go to the chart, um, the curve chart, which I found very useful, just um, this is loaded with information. And I, I um, so, the, I just want to make sure that the, the red uh, curve, which is the new, the idealized curve, it's, and, and it's hand-drawn, I appreciate that, but, but it's really meant to start at zero, right? Not prior to zero? Um, yes. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, I, 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 um, th that was my only uh, question. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Tony. Um, Trustee Seleg. Yes, thank you. So um, thanks, George. And, and this is a great report. I have to say there's so much uh, work and thought went into it. Uh, it's very impressive. Um, could you, I have a quick question. Could you go to the slide that has the number, the, the monetary or this one? Monetary, numerical timelines? Yes. So George, there's one point on the slide where you said a stakeholder wanted to clarify that the, I think it was the percentile won't change year over year. Does that just mean the percentile is based on the standard and not on the numbers in any given year. Yeah, they wanted to make sure that we characterize this as a 90th percentile. And they wanted to make sure that this was going to be a fixed number. In other words, that the, the time period at which a case would be defined to be in backlog wasn't going to change from year to year. 
Um, and, and that is correct. We are we are proposing these as fixed standards moving forward. So moving forward, whether next year or three years from now, assuming they remain in place, um, a case would be in backlog if it's time to close at any one of these stages um, exceeded this time period. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you both. I have just noticed that we have uh, an attendee who has raised their hand, uh, Betty Williams from the CLA. If um, if if it's okay with the with the board, I'd like to let her ask her question uh, or provide a brief comment. Um, Ms. Williams, if you're ready to do so, uh, your microphone should be enabled, I believe. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Right, thank you. This is excellent, um, and I appreciate all the hard work you are doing on this. It's very impressive. I just had one question. The presenter said something about uh, using the example of intake, the proposed standard average being 30 days. And he said something no more than 10% of the cases should exceed. And I didn't catch the end of that. Was it the back? Was it the proposed backlog matrix? The 45? Yes. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you for the clarifying question and the, and the answer, Mr. Cardona. Okay, I think we're ready for Ms. Yang. Okay, staffing needs analysis. So SB211 requires some analysis uh, to be done for the staffing level that we need to meet the standards. Uh, the issue is, first of all, we need uh, uh, legislative guidance on whether the proposed standards are, re are realistic um, and uh, whether that meet their uh, requirements. Uh, another uh, thing is that we, uh, are still in the process of making changes uh, based on the uh, one-year development process of the SB211 proposal. Uh, so based on those two reasons, um, our solution is to uh, outline the preliminary step needs analysis in the proposal, and uh, we will develop a, a, a plan for a comprehensive step needs analysis including examination of OCTC's procedures for operational improvement. So preliminary staffing uh, needs analysis, we use two methods to just uh, double check. The first one is um, uh, based on 2021 workload study. Uh, uh, the methodology is very similar to the 2018 workload study that, that was already reviewed by LAO and the state auditor before. Uh, we used the time study uh, survey to estimate work hours for case processing tasks. Then we have uh, we we have this Delta uh, focus group sessions to uh, listen to staff's feedback on how many um, additional staff members for them to meet their task um, uh, for them to uh, process their cases in a in a timely manner. So the feedback came uh, based on 2021 uh, time study is that. For attorneys, uh, they report they need 47 additional attorneys uh, to uh, process the uh, 2021 caseload. Uh, investigator 25, then we, uh, we did the rest of the analysis. So the total number came out uh, uh, was 119. Then we used another, uh, uh, I would say less uh, staff, feedback, but more sort of uh, linear relationship based on the uh, uh, case processing time and the staffing level. Uh, so we look at that, how um, based on the case processing standards, uh, what are the proposed um, weighted average days for, uh, uh, for the OCTC staff members to pro process cases after the investigation stage? Then we look at the current speed. So we compared current speed and the proposed speed. And the, uh, and the difference is to meet the proposed speed, we need um, have 20% more additional um, uh, staff members. Um, we focused on the investigator, 20% uh, of 29% uh, of more investigators is 23. Then we use the ratio between uh, attorney um, uh, versus investigator to come up, up with attorney number and same, same methodology applies to all the, uh, the rest of staff members. 
So the total based on this methodology, uh, simply based on the difference between the proposed speed and the current speed is 78. Let me just uh, let me jump in here. I see that Trustee Noel has raised his hand. Do you have a question, uh, Trustee? Yeah, I, yes, I do. If if we could go back to your very first slide, please. I believe it says SB two one one issue final staffing needs analysis will not be delivered with the proposal. Then it says solution. Introduce a preliminary staffing needs analysis in the proposal. Why are we ignoring that we're not supposed to deliver staffing needs with the proposal? I know it says final up there, and you're and we're cutting words and making it preliminary, but it seems that we're always doing something that might um, tick off uh, somebody in the legislature. And I'm just trying to say, why don't we just do a separate uh, preliminary one if you want, then do a final one, but do it separate from the, uh, from the case processing standards, which it seems to be the goal here and whoever, uh, wrote SP 211 uh, to keep them separate. That's all. I, I'm just concerned about that and about our relationship to SB 211 and what it says literally. I don't I don't um think uh trustee Noel that the intention was to keep them separate. Um the directive was to develop uh, staffing requirements that were needed in order to effectuate the case processing standards proposal. I think our concern has been, and, and this is why it's on the slide, we're not actually providing a final staffing needs analysis with the case processing standards. And that is, um, you know, if we were adhering strictly to the statutory requirement, we would be. I really um, thank Trustee Seleg for his remarks on this issue at the last meeting, because that is what drove us to do this preliminary analysis. Uh, and, and I will say that when we vetted this proposal with legislative staff, we did indicate, you know, we we're very transparent about this fact that we would not include a final staffing needs analysis. And we shared the reason why. One, obviously they need to tell us what case processing standards they're actually gonna approve. But I think the second, uh, number two on this slide is even more important. And I think it did resonate. It's that, you know, George is relatively new in the role still, and he's gotten a lot of feedback as well as many of us through this SB 211 uh, development process that is going to inform changes he is, has, and will be making in OCTC operations. And so those changes need to be implemented before we do a true and accurate assessment of the staffing levels needed to implement the case processing standards. So I think the fact that these are paired and not in a separate report is not inconsistent with the statute. The inconsistency perhaps is that we are not including a final proposal, but we do have this estimate. And the last slide we were going to get to is you know, we've um, quantified that in economic terms so that they can really see what we're talking about based on this preliminary analysis, they being the legislature, um, legislative staff, the LAO, I think they're going to be very interested in this uh, data point here. Um, well, can I ask you, did you say that uh, when you talked with the legislative, uh, with either the LAO or or with uh, AIDS or, or wh wh whatever it was you talked with, with the legislature. Are you saying that they said, despite what it says, that in the proposal is a staffing analysis, that they said that's a good idea, that's okay? I don't want to, I don't want to overstate it. I want to say that they really want, I believe, the desire is for us to be accurate 
and for us not certainly not to overstate the case for staff and understanding that there is um, an intention to implement efficiencies into the process itself I think there was appreciation that we were going to effectuate those changes before saying we need you know x positions definitively so yes we are you know I mean, I, I think per, perhaps what you're getting to is it's a risk. We're not providing a final number. We have provided a range here along with the corresponding cost so they can get sort of a rough order of magnitude of what we're talking about. My thought is this range will come down based on the efficiencies that are being implemented. Um, so I, I, I don't, I don't want to overstate it. I, I just, you know, we did share that this is the approach and I, I don't, I'm not anticipating um, a strong negative reaction, but again, I could be wrong. <laughs> I, 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 would, but I would say that um, uh, I would do everything I could to anticipate uh, what might be their reaction and, and, and provide the information in a way that it still gets provided, but maybe not in the proposal. It seems to me that so two days later, we can send a staffing proposal that is preliminary and then follow that up with a separate proposal. I, uh, that, I'm just talking politics right now. And I'm talking uh, a way to make sure that our relationship with legislators uh, is one that they see us as trying uh, um, to do uh, what the legislation tells us to do. That's all. Uh, and that's really all. I mean, I, I, I know there's going to be efficiencies. I have, I have great uh, respect for uh, uh, George's resume and for what he can bring to this, this, this uh, <clears throat> um, problem. Uh, and I think, uh, I think he's going to do a great job. Right now, I'm just talking about how it looks and to put it into the proposal, put anything about staff analysis into the proposal. And that's it. And if everybody thinks that it's okay, uh, then, then fine. I, I just think it ought to be separate. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Leah. I appreciate it. Th thank you both. I, I think the discussion you're having um, certainly is, I think, on several of our minds. and. Um, it, it's clear to me that there's been consideration of the issue that Trustee Noel has raised. Uh, Mr. Cordoni, your hand went up and down a couple of times. Let me just ask. Okay, it looks like you're good. All right. Yes, Appreciate everything thinking. was said. That's what I figured. Thank you for letting us interrupt you. Uh, do you. Do you have further on the staffing needs analysis? Um, we have um, one slide about the final staffing needs analysis and the timeline and what uh, other factors we will uh, take into account in the final uh, step need analysis. Uh, you can see it's much more sophisticated and also take into account the uh, planned operational improvement uh, in the, uh, into this final step need analysis. I just want to add one anecdote here. Uh, 2018, we provided that workload study. Uh, one of the feedback provided by LAO uh, in their 2019 report was that your staffing needs analysis is based on the process you, you currently have, and you don't know whether that's the most optimal process. So this, this is, again, you know, we are kind of taking into their uh, feedback in their report. We also had the conversation with them. Uh, first of all, uh, when, while we were having the conversation, the report, the draft report did not include preliminary staffing needs analysis. And they felt strong that we should include that based on the SB211 requirements. Uh, but we, uh, uh, we, both them and, and uh, both they and we agree that um, uh, almost half of the pages in the report you can see talk about the feedback from uh, experts, from OCTC staff members, from different states, uh, our research in different states, in different agencies. 
is about operational improvement. So we do need some time to, to improve that, then uh, factor that in the final staff needs analysis. And that's the last one. Okay, thank you. Any other trustees have uh, questions, commentary on either of the either of the pieces that have been presented so far? Okay, then uh, Mr. Tony, please go ahead. Uh, would this be appropriate time to just ask a couple clarifying questions? Absolutely. Okay. So um, one of the things I really appreciated about the report is the detail in which it went into the process, the mechanics of the discipline system. Um, I know for me, it was very educational. Um, I, did, I was not aware of all the different pieces. And what I'm curious about, and I tried looking and I probably didn't look in the right place. Remind me, there are two acronyms. I couldn't figure out what they meant. The first is, this is under charging. Okay, what is an NDC? An NDC is a notice of disciplinary charges. So that's the document we file in state court, in state bar court when we are pursuing charges against an attorney. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And the other one is just a matter of uh, information for acronyms. E-N-E-C? That's an early neutral evaluation conference. Under the rules, before we can file a notice of disciplinary charges, we have to give the attorney against whom we propose filing charges an opportunity to have a conference before an early neutral evaluation um, person. It's basically a state bar court judge who comes in, reviews presentations by the party and gives a preliminary opinion as to um, the charges and potential discipline. It essentially is a pre-filing um, opportunity um, for both sides to get an assessment from the court as to the likely results if charges are filed. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, the, um, couple other questions on, uh, there's a part two, uh, propose, uh, case processing standards and backlog, uh, metric. And, um, this, um, step one eliminate 60 day or greater gap in case activity. I just want to point that out as something that I think is extremely valuable that, uh, George, you and your team took the time to analyze and it, it, it really feels like it's going in the right direction for me of having identified the fact that there are 44% uh, of cases um, closed in investigation or charging stages that had case activity timelines of 60 days or greater. That's a large number. And even if you're not able to get all of those done, uh, you, know, at, you know, eliminate the gap for all of them, um, th th this is a big structural um, strategy to uh, uh, reduce um, the backlog. And I, I just wanted to point that out because it's, um, I, I, I thought that was commendable to have uh, found that in your analysis. And um, I, so, so yes, so those are my those are my remaining questions. Thank you very much. So credit for that analysis should actually go to MAD. They're the ones who looked at the statistics and actually saw that there were these gaps throughout the cases. So well, good. I was happy to see it in the report. Thank you. Thank you to MAD. Truly, thank you to thank you to everyone. And I, I think as the report has laid out, this is um, this has been a multi step process. Each phase of the process has involved quite a bit of um, analysis and continuing work and refinement. So uh, I know that I appreciate that as well. Any, any other um, questions or comments from the trustees? If not, you will have seen that uh, this item has a resolution attached to it, um, essentially moving the item forward, approving the case processing standards and the staffing needs analysis. Madam Secretary, if you would put that up for the board and the public's consideration. I would appreciate it. Any final discussion before I ask for a motion on the resolution? Seeing none, may I have one?
Uh, <clears throat> this is Sean, I'll move the item. Thank you, Trustee Seleg. Hi, Lynn, I'll second. Trustee Chen, we have a motion by Seleg, a second by Chen. May I have the roll? Broughton? Yes. Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Not present. Dela Cruz? Not present. Seleg? I'm sorry, um, uh, Noel? <clears throat> Does the resolution as stated, does it allow for the separation of the staffing needs analysis from the rest of the report. We can take a look at it. I believe that's how it's been presented to us. And it seems to me that that's the expectation of the staff and, and quite frankly, the led staff and uh, the other two uh, uh, entities with whom we've checked. I'm sorry. I, 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 I want to um, be clear. The report that's attached to this item has a section on staffing needs analysis. So the way it's drafted now, it is part of the, the SB 211 report. Um, it is not my understanding that there is any um, intention or legislative direction to have two separate reports. I think that the issue is that we are not providing a final staffing number. We are instead saying, here's the preliminary analysis, and we will later next year provide you with a final once these operational efficiencies have been implemented. So it is not, Ruben, right now in, in, in the one report, you have a section on staffing needs analysis. It's not, a, it's not a separate standalone document. Next year, when we submit the final number, it will be a separate standalone um, analysis. I and hope it's, that's helpful. It, well, it's clear in that report that that section on the staffing needs analysis is preliminary and that, yeah, right, and that um, the legislative, the, the LAO and ledge staff and the auditor um, are aware of that and are expecting that in the report that we're forwarding. In that, in that case, I vote yes. Thank you. Seleg, uh, Trustee Seleg, you're on mute. Sorry, you're having a problem. Um, yes. Thank you. Shelby, not present. Soil? I'm an aye. Stallings, not present. Tony? Aye. Six ayes, zero nays. The motion carries. Thank you, trustees. That'll take us to item seven, I think it's 702, um, which is the annual discipline report. Ms. Wilson, would you kick us off, please? Sure. This is the annual discipline report that you've seen every year, although we are now uh, submitting it on a different timeline and um, uh, sort of bridging a, a, the transition to a new time frame. So you have two years worth of data and different um, data depictions in this report. Uh, Lisa Chavez and Yuin Jiang are going to just briefly walk you through some of the highlights. I would just say sort of from an overarching standpoint that we really try to adhere very strictly to what is required to be in this report with the understanding that once the case processing standards are approved, there will be a need to um, um, have corresponding changes to the annual reporting requirements because the annual reporting requirements ultimately need to reflect the case processing standards. So this is in many ways, uh, as I said, a transition or a bridge year. Um, Yuin and Lisa, why don't you? Okay, hi, good afternoon. I'm gonna start us off, let me share our screen. Everyone see my screen okay? Okay, so let's start off with just a really big picture uh, with reminder with regards to what the annual discipline report is and perhaps will benefit our newest, newest trustee as well. So Business Professions Code um, 6086.15a really outlines a set of requirements for the state bar to produce a report that addresses each of these 15 topics listed here. And in particular, uh, it outlines as 
we mentioned that SB 211 changed the language in this statute to change it from the deadline uh, to October 31st of this year and also discuss how it's going to, we're going to also change the reporting requirements to report on a fiscal year basis. And I'm going to describe that a little bit more in the next slide. So Senate Bill 20, uh, 211 not only directed the state bar to um, propose a new set of case processing standards and a backlog metric, they also took that opportunity to make some changes to the AD reporting requirements for the ADR. So over here on the left describes the general changes to the report. So as mentioned, uh, we have a new deadline every year. It used to be um, April 30th, and now it's October 31st of each year. The reporting period has changed to a fiscal year ending June 30th. However, the um, SB 211 directed the state bar that for the 2022 ADR, which is the report you're reviewing today, should we report on both fiscal and calendar years, which is why the report is like over 180 pages because we produce a set of tables addressing each of those 15 uh, uh, topics for the fiscal year and then for the calendar year. So again, this is meant to be a transitional year. And then also SB 211 uh, directed the state bar to report on previous five years worth of data. Before that, we only had to report on three. And this is where data is available. Here on the right describes actual new reporting requirements with regards to the topics that we're discussing. So first, we're, um, we're asked to report on the inventory of cases that are open at the start of the, the reporting period, how many were closed, et cetera. What's really, and you'll see that in what's what we call SR-1. What's really interesting about that table is that it directed us to report out on the entire inventory of cases. That means all, all case types. Um, some of you remember that whenever we talk about do our reporting, we talk about ADR cases. Previous versions of ADR were really limited to a set number of cases. This particular table uh, directed the state board to talk about the entire inventory. And that's so just so just for your information, that's why perhaps when you see some numbers there, they may look slightly different than numbers in the other tables because the rest of those tables are, are based on the ADR cases. And we can go over that if you'd like. Uh, next, we, um, they asked us to really change how we discuss the backlog metric. Before we would just reported on the number of cases that were closed at the end of the year in backlog, S3211 directed the state bar to really flesh out this a little bit more. And in particular, we're reporting on the number and percent of cases that did and did not meet case processing goals. And you see that in table two. And will they also very explicit to, show, to, to uh, report this data by two different types of cases, non-complex cases and complex cases. So all of that information on how we define a complex case is also listed in the report. And then finally, a new reporting requirement with regards to Business Professions Code 6101 uh, add, added additional de details with regards to our compliance with uh, the requirement to transmit cases within 30 days. Okay, so just a really big picture. Uh, this is the report contents. Uh, the beginning of the report is a brief narrative, and this is where we summarize all of SB 211's impact on the ADR. Here we also tell the reader other changes we made to the ADR, and then, then we also uh, tell the reader about our performance highlights. After that narrative, you're going to see those 15 tables that I mentioned. First, listing for the fiscal year, and then those tables are essentially repeated, but the data is reported for the calendar year. And again, that was required by FB211 for this year only. And then finally, the report concludes with a set of appendices. This is where you can find information on terminology. Uh, we have a section there on a potential conflicts of interest rule 2021, 2201. Um, you'll see our appendix that really describes the, the attorney discipline system. We have an appendix that describes, has a set of tables where we made some changes. The auditor, uh, which year it was, but asked the state bar, recommended that the state bar, anytime we make a change to the ADR, they recommended that we provide uh, the readers with, given this change you made, provide the reader with what those numbers would have looked like had you not made that change methodologically, so that we have an appendix that outlines those changes. And then finally, we have a, an appendix that really just takes the reader down into the methodology of each of these tables. Okay, so now I'm going to hand it over to Ewing to uh, share some performance highlights. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, one of the uh, new table we generated based on SB211 requirements uh, is the inventory, inventory table. This provides an overview of the caseload that OCTC handles.
So opening during that, those are the new cases open during uh, either the fiscal year or the calendar year. I, I just want to uh, bring your attention to pending and year at year start. Uh, one of the questions raised by the last staff was, uh, are those backlog cases? No, they are not. So for example, one case could be uh, open in uh, December 29th, um, 2020, and they will be counted in 2021 as a pen, pending at, at year start because they were open the year before. But they are, they are not backlog because they are only in our system for two days. So just uh, to clarify, those are the caseloads, but they don't uh, reflect the backlog. Next slide, please. Then this slide is about backlogs. Uh, they are defined in um, uh, SB211 language as cases not meeting uh, case processing goals. And the goals again, six months for non-complex cases, 12 months for complex cases. So I will give you a minute to look at the figure, total cases, non-complex and the complex cases. And the, the percentage of those cases met or did not meet the goals. So in, in general, my takeaway is for non-complex cases, we have more and more cases that met goals. So fewer and fewer non-complex uh, non-complex cases are in backlog status. But for complex cases, that's um, something we need to um, focus our energy on is we still have 30% of complex cases that were defined as backlog cases. And the number is, give you a sense of what 30% means here, is 865 cases in F, uh, fiscal year 2022. They're the, they're um, they're the, oh no, sorry, it's 1100. They are the backlog cases for non-complex and 8065 uh, uh, for complex and 8065 for non-complex. All right, next slide, please. All right, the, another key performance metric is case processing time. Uh, how fast we process or we close or file a case. Um, again, the trend is, um, in alignment with the uh, uh, backlog uh, slide. So cases closed by OCTC, the green one, the bottom line, it's, it's decreasing, remain pretty much constant actually. But the cases uh, for the, 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 the top line, cases, filed in state bar court, cases when that uh, went to charging and uh, file, were filed in state bar court, uh, they, they took longer time during the past five years. All right, next slide. Is this the final slide? Oh, the, yeah, this is about the discipline yeah, cost. I just wanna highlight this for the, the board um, to make sure I, I'm being fully transparent. Um, statutorily, we are required to provide data regarding the cost to the discipline system. You can see here in the bottom rows, there are three functions that were only a portion of the cost of these respective areas have been identified in previous ADRs as being part of the discipline system. We were dig we've been digging into this as part of preparing for our current state audit. And it looks like the genesis for this split is, is actually a, um, the 1998 petition to the Supreme Court for a licensing fee uh, when the fee bill was vetoed um, at that time. When you fast forward to the last time the Supreme Court um, authorized a licensing fee, which I believe was for the 2017 fees, only communications was apportioned out in this way. The remainder, licensee billing and general counsel, 100% of those costs were identified by the Supreme Court as being part of the discipline function. 
So I believe it's more appropriate to align ourselves with the more recent um, court interpretation. I'm somewhat um, dismayed that I, I never caught this before that we were using sort of a 30 year old uh, interpretation of what was discipline cost. So in this current ADR, I'd like to modify the numbers. This is not what you see in the report that's been posted. The numbers that are highlighted to reflect the full cost of these programs. And of course, this change would be footnoted and clearly explained. But I wanted to uh, make sure to raise this to the board's attention here. Ms. Wilson, may, may I ask a clarifying question there then? Sure. The, the percentage, the percentage numbers that are um, included parenthetically after the those three areas, or at least the two that are um, highlighted, is the is the point here that seventy three percent of the cost for our licensee billing is paid by the licensing fee? I'm, I'm right. I'm okay. I'm sorry. I, this I could have made this clear. Currently, we identify 73% of licensee billing costs and 76.3% of OGC costs as being discipline related. So every year when we report in the ADR, we're basically taking a percentage of the total cost of those functions. Uh, the numbers in the far right column reflect 100% of both of those costs, not a portion of the, of the cost. And I'm proposing making that change because when I look back at the genesis of these percentages, they're really coming from this very old um, Supreme Court a petition. And I really then took a look at what happened in 2017 and the court did not so state that only a portion of these functions are discipline related. And that's really the only guidance we have on how to apportion our budget um, beyond the obvious OCTC and state bar court. So my recommendation is to go from licensee billing 73% to 100% general counsel. So that's the recommendation. Okay. And that's that's that right-hand column. I appreciate yes. that recommendation. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions on uh, any of this? Okay. Ms. Shang, was this the final slide? Right. This is the final oh, slide. So Trustee yeah. Sewell has his hand up. Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, to comment, uh, and, may, and maybe this is a more of an overarching uh, kind of comment. Um, I know every time we do this annual discipline report, um, we're hit with a uh, an array of uh, of numbers, and uh, and you know the numbers are, are sort of very striking. And I know that um, the, those numeric and those numerics and those metrics are uh, integral to our response to the um, uh, what's required uh, under law. But I, I always feel like um, uh, I use the word shortchanged. I, I always use, feel like I'm, uh, it's, it's somewhat um, out of context for me to completely understand uh, the numbers because there are, there are other things that are going on. Uh, like for instance, I don't know um, uh, how the numbers re equate to sort of uh, um, you know, current levels of staffing in, in, in terms of uh, uh, where things uh, where things stand with that. I don't know if we've had uh, a certain number of trainings or workshops or those sorts of things. Uh, I don't know uh, within uh, within some of these numbers, are there uh, certain categories of attorneys that are more um, uh, prone to uh, uh, to be a part of uh, specific sort of complex cases or, or, or non-complex cases, and so I don't necessarily know if it's a part of the the annual dis uh, annual discipline uh, sort of report requirements, but I really feel like it. it I don't have a full picture of, uh, of of where we are in terms of either progress we're making or um, or um, in some cases maybe um, uh, regression. Uh, that that that's occurring because I don't feel like I have a, a full picture of everything that's uh, that that's going on and it this may not be the place for all of that but uh, I am trying to uh, sort of understand that better and be able to um, in my own mind sort of formulate you know um, uh, the strategy and the overall sort of plan of attack uh, that we're using to try to uh, to, uh, to to reduce. Uh, the caseloads that are in the discipline system, as well as 
uh, feel like we have a, a good handle on on how it is that we're moving forward. And so I don't know. I, I think there's a question in 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 all of that. Um, but I, I just trying to gain a, a better understanding uh, and how we move forward with sort of this type of a presentation, which I mean, I know we're doing exactly what it is that we're required to do, but just for me as a board member to having a better understanding of the backdrop and the context in, in which we're operating. Thank I, you. I can, go, go ahead, Ms. Chang, I'm sorry. I can quickly respond uh, and uh, you, you guys know I'm very new here, so uh, my response just will well show my ignorance about the intention of the ADR. But from a sort of a fresh perspective, my quick takeaway is uh, ADR, uh, uh, my understanding is the purpose of ADR is to provide um, the overview of how OCTC uh, handles uh, discipline cases. This how includes the speed. This how includes the concern about number of backlog cases. Uh, of course, all those need to be uh, reflected in the in the inventory, which is how how many cases they are handling. Uh, one thing this report does not include is the staffing. Uh, 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 Trustee uh, Arnold, you just mentioned the staffing is is not required and it's not included. Uh, do we need to, uh, do, should we include some, at least, you know, trend tape, uh, trend uh, data about staffing levels? Uh, maybe we can. Uh, and my uh, very quick takeaway is uh, the ADR probably, it's, it's a little difficult for a report to come with that uh, high to provide actionable items based on data. So those actionable items need to be reflected in some other internal reports, including one of the recommendations made in 2020 audit report is that they required State Bar to uh, design and develop interim benchmark reports. So we know whether we are, you know, hitting the goals, meeting the goals, not at the end of the year, but you know, in between. So that's a that's an example for me to understand how the data can really inform changes. Uh, I don't know whether ADR can or should serve this purpose, but I, I just feel like this is ADR just serve at you know at that level of uh, analysis uh, at, at this point. Yes, and I, I I appreciate the I appreciate the response. And um, and maybe I think uh, I, I'm not sure what the what the proper venue is for a sort of a fuller conversation about uh, about some of this, but um, and, and, and excuse me for using a sports analogy, but um, if I were to use a sports analogy just in terms of let's say a, a game, you either you know you know what the score of the game was, but uh, and that's what the numbers tell me what the score of the game was. But I don't know a whole lot about. Did you lose in the last few seconds of the game? You played really, really. Uh, you're, you're 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 playing well, really well because you you've improved. Did you just put in a new offense? I don't know any of these other sorts of intangibles and sort of nuances. Uh, I, I feel like that could help me um, understand. You know, uh, sort of the you know, how it is that we need to sort of formulate strategy going forward in this context of the numbers. And I know we're responding to what we're being asked to do in terms of the report, but I'm just also looking for that venue where we can have you know, some of this additional sort of, uh, of conversation around this. Thank, thank you both. I see that Mr. Cardona has joined us and raised his hand. So I'm gonna uh, let him respond to any of this if he cares to. And then this was- Sure, and, and I think the, there is a there is a forum for that, and indeed there will be, I believe, some agenda items on the next board meeting um, to discuss um, in different ways. Not so much looking just at the the kind of final score, but looking at some of the metrics that go into how the office operates, including staffing, turnover, and other things. So, um, as as you know, we presented our dashboard, a dashboard of metrics at one of the previous meetings. That'll be a regular feature going forward at various meetings. And I think that's the place where we can get into kind of the ins and outs of how the office is working, the changes that have been made, what's going on, and, and whether we are improving in terms of those metrics. And those metrics then, some of them feed into the ADR at the end of the year. Does that, does that help? Yeah, thank you. Ms. Wilson, something to add? 
Yeah, I was just going to say something similar. I think one uh, venue, Arnie, is the dashboard reporting that is now coming to the board uh, regularly, and that does include staffing data and a lot of the more of a rich sort of data set. And then we were talking about the staffing needs analysis earlier. That's And I also mentioned the fact that we will need to propose new metrics for reporting in the ADR based on the new case processing standards. So I think we have through both the staffing needs analysis itself, and then through recommendations about what future ADR reporting should um, comprise, we have opportunities to advance a more sort of comprehensive picture about the discipline system. So um, I think we'll have plenty of opportunity to address these, these issues. Thank you all. Uh, Trustee Noel, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, um, <clears throat> since just before this, I sat through two hours of the diversity summit of the state bar. I, I'd like to know, and I, and I you know, there, there are strings that I think have been uh, throughout um, our discussions on this, but I'd like to know how this um, how our discipline approach um, informs the state bar's interest in promoting equity uh, and inclusion. I, I, I want to make sure we are looking at the discipline system from many angles. I, I saw and heard a number of different uh, looks at it or the desire to have different looks. And this is one that I'm thinking about a lot. And I don't, <clears throat> I'd, like, I'd like to know um, uh, the ethnicity and gender uh, of the people that are receiving discipline. For instance, if 5% of lawyers are African-American, but 35% of the lawyers disciplined are African-American. I think we have a responsibility from an equity standpoint to look at that and try to fix it. But if we can, we, we may not. And I, I, I know that this is something that is important to the state bar. Um, it's just hard for me in this kind of presentation about the, the ADR, how it um, either meets or attempts to show uh, uh, how this helps uh, our equity discussion. And I, I don't care who answers this. Anybody? Well, I. I, don't, I think the short answer is it doesn't now. I think that's a great suggestion for future ADR reporting. Um, and I think perhaps that we have, first of all, it's not statutorily required, right? But perhaps mm -hmm. fallen into one of the mistakes that I think many organizations do, which is siloing the conversation. So certainly on a separate track, we've done a lot of work on racial disparities in the discipline system. I don't know, um, to be candid, that we have talked about incorporating that data into our statistical reporting. And it makes a lot of sense to, do, to, to think about that or to do it. A follow up a question on that to either Mr. Cardona or you, Ms. Wilson. Um, is it correct to assume that our Odyssey system will allow us to do that with some relative ease? Yes, we can certainly do it easily. Yeah. I don't know if it's just because of Odyssey. <laughs> we, have, we, we have the data. We have the data we need to do that. Okay. Uh, Trustee Tony. Thank you, uh, Chair D uh, Duran. Um, my question has to do with uh, SB 211 and this shift in reporting times. And um, 
it's um, it looks like I just want to make sure that the transition um, that was brought up earlier is from a calendar year to a state fiscal year. And so, um, and maybe I'm confused, I guess going forward, um, are we gonna be expected as a state bar with this uh, annual discipline report to submit one a year, which would correspond with the end of the state fiscal year? Or will we be required to submit two a year, one for the fiscal year and one for the calendar year? So that's my first uh, question for clarification purposes. Moving forward, we are, we are gonna just report fiscal year only. Okay, okay. And that fiscal year report covers through the end of June 30th. Mm -hmm. And it has the same four month um, turnaround to present the report. In this case, it will be the end of October mm -hmm. every year. And so during the process, the legislative process of the uh, budget uh, process and the uh, process of going through the um, judiciary committees the most recent data on discipline that the legislature will have, unless they ask for, you know, obviously they have a right to ask for an update, but in terms of an annual, they'll have the, um, for, through the end of June from the previous year, instead wow. of the end of September of previous year. And that's their choice, okay? They, 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 they passed this. So it, it, it makes me wonder, and not for a, a you know, resolution or, or deep discussion today, but it does make me wonder um, as, as a member of the finance committee, whether we should look at our, our own fiscal year um, and reporting, but that, you know, it's just that the, um, you know, the, the, um, a budget really is a representation of the, um, you know, of the uh, activities. And if, if you know, the discipline, is, it, so, so anyway, I, I just, you know, this is just a matter for further consideration. Um, you know, taking a look at this report, taking a look at the other reports the legislature asks us, and if they're moving more towards a fiscal year, that's just something for us to think about. So that's just a, um, a comment, um, you know, nothing to do about uh, today. My only other comment on this is- um, can, I, can I do an interrupt for just a second? Please, please. Mark, I, Mark, I wasn't sure I, I com completely, completely understood your, your, uh, your, your last point. Was it just to try to see if we could marry up the schedules? Is that, is that what you're saying? I, I'm saying we should think about it. I, I don't have a strong opinion right now, but it's something we can think about. Obviously it would be at the finance committee uh, level where we would start that discussion. That's part of why it's, you know, but, but it's more, I'm just reflecting on the big picture of what this means. And, um, you know, that's all. My, my, my other question is, I will just point out as I always do whenever I see um, page six of this report talks about uh, public and private reprovals is one of the areas that is um, um, reported on. And I, I, you know, I comment a lot. I want the board to have a discussion as to the merits of private reprovals. And I, I have a lot of questions about them. And I just want to know what's what you know either either um, uh, Ms. Wilson or Chair Duran. What advice do you have on where's the right place in the board process to talk about and anal ask for an analysis of private approvals? Ms. Wilson, I'll let you start, and then if, and then yeah. I can add. Sure. Well, we can always agendize that um, at any time. 
But I'm personally thinking that it might be a great topic for us to put on the agenda for the January planning session. Usually we would spend that time talking about strategic planning and modifications to the plan, but we have spent a lot of time finalizing a plan and it will just have been six or seven months um, that, that our strategic plan has been in place come the January planning session. So I think we have time certainly to do a deep dive into certain top topical areas. And this makes sense to me. I, I think it would be really um, important. It's an important topic and we should advertise well in advance so that you can hear public comment because I think that will be very illuminating also on this topic. And, and quite frankly, I think that um our regular meeting in November might be an opportunity for folks to start to lay the groundwork for some questions uh, um, that we might want to have answered at that January meeting. In other words, to provide staff with some lead time on gathering data or other information that uh, would help that conversation along in January so that it, uh, it can be put to good use that meeting. Thank you, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I can probably do that even during my report uh, without necessarily a, an agenda item, but I'll look to the general counsel to confirm that for me. Okay, anything else on the um, the ADR? Thank you for the, for the comprehensive report, Ms. Chavez, Ms. Shang, and all the answers to the questions, Mr. Cardona, Ms. Wilson, and Ms. Shang. If there are no questions, can we see the resolution on the screen? Now that it's there in black and white, any other debate, questions, concerns? Seeing none, may have a motion to approve as presented. I can see Mr. Broughton just wanting to do it, but I'll let someone else. If they yes, want. I, I'll move it, move the item. Motion by Broughton. I'll second. I'll second. Second by Mr. Noel, sorry, Sean. Can we have the roll call, please? Broughton? Yes. Chen? Yes. Cisneros, not present. Dela Cruz, not present. No? Yes. Seleg? Yes. Shelby, not present. Soel? I'm a yes. Dollings, not present. Tony? Aye. Six eyes, zero nays, the motion carries. All right, thank you trustees. That brings us to the end of the special meeting. We are adjourned. We'll see you all uh, in November. Thank you staff, thank you everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.